Okay. Um, every time I practice this talk, I went way long, so now I'm going to run through really fast and go way short. So prepare your questions. Every talk I ever give, I always like to give a slide so that if you get nothing else out of the talk, you'll at least have gotten something. Um, and this is this time on my list of, of things that would be better to spend your time on than attending my talk. Um, if you're here, I'm assuming you do some vague work in C. Um, there's a project called C Control, which is basically abandoned where at this point, but it is actually really cool for uh, taking over Make and, uh, and CC and LD and all those things um, and figuring out whether, if, depending on what directory you're in, what environment variables it should set, whether it should run DCC, Ccache, how parallel to run your Make and all that stuff. Um, so check out C Control if you use, use those kind of things. Um, and the other one is one I wish I'd discovered ages ago, um, ASCII Flow, which is like an online um, ASCII diagram generator. So, you know, if you really want to spice up your comments with a few bits of ASCII art, I recommend going there and building something, cut and paste it out. Okay, with that out the way, um, when I was looking at preparing this talk, I realised that it was actually at OSDC in 2007 that... CCAN began. Um, Adam Kennedy uh, was there. I gave a, a, a talk on um, uh, basically why C coders are cool. Uh, mainly memorable because I mispronounced Kernahan. And um, Adam Kennedy came up to me afterwards and said, I've been doing some C coding recently, and why isn't there a CPAN for C? Um, one thing led to another, and late 2007, uh, we, well, nominally we, but in practice me, uh, started hacking on CCAM, um, but with a lot of moral support. Um, and so here's our rough graph of commits over time. Obviously, there's some timestamp noise in there. Um, we're showing to 2008 through uh, about a week ago. Um, so this curve is clearly exponential, so we're going to take over the world somewhere in uh, three years' time. Um, uh, this is the module count over time. Um, that's a lot more sort of flat and jagged. Um, typical of an own time project. You know, sometimes we get a lot done and sometimes not so much. Um, so there's my CCAN growth charts. Um, what I'm going to talk about mostly today is some of the CCAN issues. You think, hey, CPAN, why hasn't someone done this before? This is going to be really easy. I mean, CPAN have already done it, but I'll just do it for C. You know, file off a few serial numbers and you know, change the language, and you're done. Turns out it's not quite that easy. Um, there are several reasons. One is it's hard to build something that doesn't exist. I mean, CPAN works because people know CPAN is there. Um, people know it's where they can go to get good code and everything else. It's, it's a lot easier once you already exist to configure. To, to convince people to use it. Um, once everyone's using it, it's all easy. So you kind of go, well, all we've got to do is bootstrap. But there is a number of structural problems which make it really hard to do with a language like C. Um, C really isn't designed for modules, um, namespace being the most obvious issue. Um, you don't have these nice uh, namespacing properties that you have in modern languages. So, But also, the level of trust required to use someone's code, you may just not care. You may just be thinking, look, all I need is a... a a uh, hashing algorithm because I need to use it in this obscure corner case, I'll just grab one and use it. The problem is that won't just break that obscure corner case of code that you may not care about. It could easily corrupt something that crashes the rest of your app um, in a horrible, horrible, horrible way. It's a lot easier for some, someone else's code that you've chucked in to do a disproportionate amount of damage to the rest of your program. So it requires a great amount of trust to use someone's code, so it's a lot easier to just go, look, I'll write it myself and then I know what I'm getting into. Because it's, it's, it's actually shockingly common to think, I'll just, it'll be easier if I reuse someone else's code and to discover that debugging time is increased so much by doing that that you would have been better reinforcing it yourself. So this leads us to the CCAN golden rule, which is our code must not be ugly. This is the core rule upon which we base everything else. Because we're dealing with this trust issue. People are not in the culture of going, oh, I'll just grab something from CCAN, at least not yet. So they're going to look at it, and they're going to be thinking to themselves, is this going to hurt me more than it's going to help me? So when they look at the code, they have to go, yep, that seems sane and reasonable, I will take it. 
So our code must not be ugly, because if it's ugly, it will scare people off. Now, there are a whole heap of issues when you start thinking deeply about how you're going to deal with this. And I'm going to run through them really quite quickly. The first one is indentation. What indentation style should you use? <sighs> you know, this is one... I have, a, I have a preference, I will admit to have a preference. I have coded in the GNU coding style before, um, so I definitely have a preference. And... <laughs> CCAN does not have a preference. There are a number of issues, such as license, preferred licensing for modules and things like that, where while I may personally have an issue, it's important for CCAN not to even wade into these issues. It's nice if it's consistent, but we don't really care what it is. So a whole heap of things on which I may personally have strong opinions, you have to stand back and kind of go, thanks for the code. Indentation and a whole class of those issues, you just have to go, that's not the way I would have done it, but it's acceptable. Fine. As long as it doesn't break. It must be ugly, it must not be ugly at all. Um, and different people's definitions will be different. Portability. Well, you do need to kind of address this one. If you, at least you have to have some mechanism for addressing it. Um, and we chose to have a config.h. You may hash include a config.h and assume that that will work. And it will contain a whole heap of have blah 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 defines that you can test. You need to have some mechanism for doing this. And we chose that one and that one only. Um, Autoconf style doesn't mean autoconf. You can generate it by hand, whatever, but it's there. Metadata, you do need it. I would have really liked to just be a repository of code. Each directory has just the code in it. But you do need some metadata. At the very least, you need to say what license it's under. You need to say what other things it depends on. And it's nice to have some documentation on what the hell it is. So what's the least ugly way of doing this? This probably is not the least ugly way of doing it. But um, we chose to have an underscore info file. Um, so all the metadata is contained in one file, pretty much, uh, the compulsory underscore info file. Um, and it's actually a C program, even though it doesn't end in not C. Adam Kennedy insisted to me that very, very soon, I would figure out that in order to describe the dependencies for a module, I would quickly develop some kind of language, configuration language, to do so. Given that there is only one language that I can guarantee everyone developing for CCAN will know, that's why it's in C. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it really is a no-brainer. It should be a C program. I'm not going to go, we're going to use a Debian style greater than equal and here's what the version numbers mean. No, not doing it. It will be a C program. And it looks like this. So this is an underscore info for time. Um, it's a C program. The comments um, describe the module, blah, 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 author, license, and importantly, a nice little example program. Uh, that's half of the program. The other half is the main thing. That basically, if it depends, prints out the dependencies. In this case, time doesn't actually have any dependencies. So that's it. So that's the underscore info file. Um, very much monkey see, monkey do. Okay. Um, documentation. Okay. Um, this whole, you want people to use the thing and must not be ugly, kind of implies you want some kind of documentation. There are various standards of C documentation. All of them conflict. Um, you have to think about why you're writing documentation. I'm writing documentation because I expect people to read the documentation in the files. Not because I, I think it is absolutely insane to, for something like CCAN especially, but for any code really, to extract the documentation out and print it out and read it. It doesn't make any sense separated from the code. So we have kernel doc style, which is basically a very simple, again, monkey see, monkey do. You saw in that last one, you cut and paste an existing one, it will work. Um, humans, it's basically designed for humans to read in place, but tools can extract bits of it. Um, for example, the underscore info file, um, it extracts. That's redundant, it's also the name of the directory, but routines are dealing with time, that becomes a one-line description on the web page. Um, this gets published, etc., cetera, um, in the blurb on the web page. So tools have to be able to extract the bits out, but humans have to be able to read. Um, it's designed for humans to read, and tools to extract bits out. That's it. And never for tools to actually, never, never for humans to read anywhere else. So I'd be ready for this. Uh, test suite. 
Obviously, you've got to have a, some kind of test system. Anyone here use C unit? Yeah, I didn't think so. Oh, half of one. Okay, uh, that's exactly the problem. There is no really good standard for uh, C unit testing. There is C unit is probably the the closest. Um, and we are, of course, talking about unit testing here. Um, but that's not really the problem. The problem is, I'm going to show you a real, I'm not, I'm not going to say who this is from, but I'm going to show you a real email that we got about a, a module that someone had written um, and, and, and sent to the mail and said, here, how's my module? And this is what he said about it. Um, okay. that's, that's actually good. I'm, I'm more than happy with the whole, if you broke it, you get to keep both pieces. That is actually a very, a, a very sane user interface decision. That fits good. Mm -hmm. Two minutes again, small as possible. That bit's even better. I'm so far I'm completely with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing that you're dealing with. The compiler reads my code, why do I need to write tests? Um, if you went to the trouble of actually publishing the code, it's worth writing a test for. The good news is if your code's trivial, the tests will be trivial too. Um, so we're really talking about unit testing here. And in CCAN, we've gone for a very simple, you have a test subdirectory, and the names of the files say what kind of test it is. So a compile fail, well, compile fail test should compile a link unless we define fail. That's important because you don't want, oh, I want to make sure that this, this program doesn't compile because it should give a, a warning or an error. Um, but actually, you've got a typo in there, so it'll never compile. So the defail, basically, around the bit that you want to fail, you define that bit. Um, so that it will first test that it compiles to start with, and then it will run it with defail, and it should then break. Um, compile OK just says, look, this should compile and link successfully. This is because a lot of modules exist um, to uh, do compile time or type testing. So there's no point in runtime testing for these. You really want to do compile testing. Uh, the normal tests, however, are the run tests. This should compile and exit with zero exit status. We don't care what the program does. Um, we don't provide much in the way of infrastructure. A lot of things use the TAP library, the test anything protocol library. Um, and what happens if it doesn't exit with zero exit status? The tool that runs the tests that we give you, you don't have to use it if you don't want to, will show the user what it output. So, go nuts. Um, all we say is it should compile and exit with, when we run it, it should exit with zero status, and then it has passed. That step it should have passed. API is just like run.c, but it actually linked with the module. So run tests are not actually linked against the module. They generally go hash include dot dot slash foo.c. And the reason for that is that it is really the only sane way to do low-level testing of static functions, and it also allows you to do some really cool tricks, as we'll see later. And this kind of implies that you're suggesting there's some API stability if you provide an API test as well. Um, and anything else, any other C file in the test directory is assumed to be some helper thing and linked in with all these other tests. So it's very, very simple to write tests. Write tests like run.c or run1, run2, run3, whatever. And they should, and whatever we test if they compile and exit. That's it. We don't provide any test infrastructure for you or anything else. Go and do that. That is about as simple as we could make it, and it has covered every case we have needed to so far. Although in some cases this stuff has to do forking and all this other ugly stuff, that's fine. For the simple cases, it really, really is simple to write tests. That is as simple as I could make it, and as non ugly as I could make it. A lot of them, as I said, use the tap module, which just gives you some nice, pretty printing for your output. So, that's test suite. Namespace. What do you do about namespace, Rusty? Well, there are two kinds of namespace problems. One is C identifiers. There's no natural namespace in C. Um, and the other one is module names. Uh, who gets the STR module? Uh, C identifiers, you can't fix it without breaking the golden rule of it not, must not be ugly. I refuse to say every symbol used by a CCAN module will start with CCAN underscore foo underscore. Not happening. So the right answer is to go, we'll ignore it. Um, we have a primitive tool called namespace eyes. 
that is designed to go, actually, I've already used the name likely in my project, and I want to call it the CCAN likely module. So you know namespace eyes on likely, and it fixes up that and renames everything to CCAN underscore blah, and then goes through all the other CCAN modules that depend on it and renames those so they should all work. Um, it's a proof of concept. It's not actually a very serious, it's a really, really kind of dumb uh, program. But <laughs> the fact that it exists is sufficient for us to say, we'll deal with that when we have problems. And that's a quite a common use case to go, hey, I actually really like this module, but I have my existing code base, and I don't want to disturb it. So then our base code isn't ugly, but we give you a tool to uglify it if you want. It's a much better solution. <laughs> module names, currently we have a flat directory structure. First in, best rest. I got the STR module, so you're all screwed. Um, uh, that is something that we're looking at changing, and I'll talk about that in the future part. Build system. What build system are you going to use? The answer is we're not. Um, we have supply a set of rules. You will provide a config.h that we can hash include. You will allow us to hash include slash cans slash what name slash blah, so you can reach the other modules that you depend on. And you will compile all the C files in the top level directory, and that is the module. There's no conditional build. If you want a conditional build, you go, if have blah at the top of your C file and end if at the bottom, and you end up with an empty C file if you don't have that. That is how you control conditional. We don't do anything else. So we don't touch build systems. We just go, here are the rules on how to build a module. Um, it's not quite that simple, because of course, to get the libraries that you depend on, uh, you are going to need uh, the libs line. You're going to need to compile and execute the underscore info file. But that's the basic idea. Uh, we don't provide, we actually provide a make file helper that does it for you. But we don't buy into the build system. Okay, cool. Now, tools. This is the stuff that I like. Um, I've already talked about namespace eyes. We have a configurator, which is the world's dumbest C program that just produces a config.h by running little snippets of code. Um, for those of you who live in fear of auto... Who's, who's used autoconf and auto tools? Who liked it? Yeah, ooh, ooh. Okay. So there are two people in there. <laughs> okay. uh, the configurator is basically a little C program. I mean, for, for a lot of these people, especially working on embedded stuff, um, this is more than sufficient. Config.h, basically, you can, you can create that by hand. If you're a C programmer, you should know what Indian you're on. Um, you should know if you have various things. Flip them all off. The configurator will do it for you the same way you'd do it yourself. Um, it's a little C program that spits out config.h. It doesn't get much simpler than that. The cool one, however, is ccanlint. Um, it is called sort of three things. It's a guide on how to write a ccan module. The idea is that you can start with your directory full of code and nothing else and go ccanlint. And it will go, you don't have an underscore info file. Do you want me to make one for you? And you go, yes. And it spits out this template and then you edit and fix that. And then you run it again and it goes, hey, you don't have a test directory. Do you want me to make a test slash run.c? And it you know, makes that for you, and then hopefully you fill it out to actually do some tests. Um, <clears throat> it's also a helper to test your CCAN module. I talked about the tests that can be run and the rules on running them. CCANLint does all that for you. You just run CCANLint in the directory, and it does stuff for you. It's also a vague scorer for CCAN modules. Um, Adam Kenley pointed out that CPANS, the CPAN testing service, really saw a qualitative increase in the quality of CPAN modules when they started assigning a number, a score, to your results. Because everyone wants to get the highest score. <laughs> now, there's only a, a loose correlation between your score and the quality of your code, but there is a correlation. And he said in a number of cases, it just meant you were tweaking stuff that really was marginal. But in a lot of cases, if your score was pretty low, it did mean that it was time to do your rewrite and actually do things properly. So there is a correlation. The downside is there are a lot of CKLint tests I would like to implement that are true in 90% of cases and false in 10% of cases. And this annoys a number of other CKLint developers because they really want to get 100% on CKLint. So they object to any tests that they can't pass. So if I say, for example, it's probably a good idea if your coding style is consistent. That sounds reasonable. But if some of your code is auto-generated, it is not reasonable. And there will be someone out there who will go, but this part of the code is auto-generated, so I'll fail at secantlet tests, therefore secantlet sucks. I argue for a long time, look, you don't need to get a perfect score. Some of my models don't get a perfect score. You should probably get out, go get out a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> this is 
an argument I was the only one on that side of. <laughs> so there's a plus and a minus having this example at school. Um, here's, I'm not going to run through all these tests. Um, obviously, you have to have an underscore info file. Your dependencies have to exist, and your module has to actually build. But um, it does some trivial tests. It does some build tests. Um, it reduces your configure.h because what happens if we take out all these features that your configure.h says you have, or if we pretend we don't have them? It doesn't take out all the features because, of course, you still need to be big endian or little endian. Lying about that tends to break things. Uh, it does that. A whole lot of licensing tests that went in recently, you would be amazed um, how many bugs that found. Uh, I had actually mislabeled a module as LGPL, whereas, in fact, as the header said in the code, it was GPL. So it scans for headers and stuff like that. More annoying is somebody decides to write a BSD module, but one of their dependencies is LGPL. That's misleading. It's not wrong, but somebody's going to call it BSD code. They grab the table with it and its dependencies. Actually, the LGPL is going to override it. It's going to effectively be LGPL. We still have a bug, uh, an override for one module that has exactly that problem. Um, <coughs> so. Um, Documentation test. This is one of my favourite ones. Um, we check that you've given, some, given an example somewhere. At least one example. Um, we check that the examples are relevant. The thing that you're documenting should be mentioned somewhere in the example. That found at least two places where cut and paste meant that actually I was showing the, the example was cut and paste from the one above and didn't document the thing that was supposed to be helpful at all. This is cute. We actually extract them and compile them. We have some pretty ugly heuristics to try to figure out Okay, so does this look like it belongs inside a function, or does it kind of look like it doesn't? And what if we chain it to the previous one? So your examples don't have to be standalone programs. They can actually, if your header is documented nicely, you can actually chain the examples really, really well. Here's my add function, little example. Here's my delete function, little example. And it will go, that doesn't compile on its own. Does it compile with the last one? Oh, yes, it does. Um, and it gives you quite ugly output. It goes, here's the little things I tried if, if it fails. Um, that's incredibly useful. Examples that aren't compiled and aren't tested are hopeless. Uh, examples run, you can go one step further and put a comment in there saying, given foo outputs bar. And if it sees that comment, it will go, okay, let's actually execute it and feed foo in standard input and on the command line and check the standard output to see if it contains bar. So you can actually create tests out of examples fairly trivially. Um, testing is obviously a big thing that CKMLED does. It runs through and does. You know, uh, okay, that header's line should be in there. But basically, it goes through and it compiles up all your tests, and then it runs all your tests, and then it runs them under Valgrind, and it checks that Valgrind doesn't report any memory leaks, um, and it, it runs, it can recompile them with coverage, and runs it under coverage, and gives you a score based on what your test coverage is. You get one bonus point for hitting 100%. Um, otherwise, you get up to five. So you get, you get one point for 50%, two points for 75%, three points for 875 etc. And if you hit 100, you get a bonus point. So you can get six total. Then it recompiles them with those feature flags removed from config. That it, it's not exhaustive. It doesn't. It doesn't remove individual ones of the config. That because that would be um, obviously uh, common material, um, and it doesn't remove them and recompile the examples and check they still compile and run under Valgrind, etc., etc. It doesn't do all the combinations, but it does do an awful lot. Um, so basically, what I do, the way I develop a module is I just run CK and Lint again and again and again, and it just does everything for me. I don't use the make for anything like that. CKMLint will build it, test it, run the test, extract the documentation, check. And CKMLint is this gradually evolving tool, because every time we come up with a cool new test, we chuck it in. Um, now, this is CKMLint as of a couple of days ago. Um, as you can see, it's a little bit hard, so we're going to cover it in two halves. Oh, that was really cool. I would put the left one in the right one. Um, we have about uh, 10 modules that aren't dependent or used by anything else. These little, little lonely ones up here. Um, we have about another 10 modules um, that are only used by other things. Build assert. I talked about modules that are only designed to break compile. Build, concert, build, build assert says you shouldn't build if this isn't right. Um, let me have a few others for my time module there. No. Um, compiler, a whole heap of wrappers uh, for various GCC things like printf attributes and uh, no return and all those things. Very, very simple. So you can see it's used by a whole other module. We've got modules here in yellow. We've got about, I'm going to say, 22 of those, uh, which 
only use other modules. These are the kind of things that usually are fairly useful. Um, and then you've got the orange, they're supposed to be orange, uh, little sort of khaki, the, the ones in the middle that are both using other things and used by other things. So it's a reasonably connected graph of about 68, 70 odd um, So that's how it is today. I, I really want to go through some of my favourite ones. And I cut myself right down to one slide because I'm low on time. For each, uh, for those of you who's, who've ever had script envy, your problems are over. <laughs> <laughs> this is the world's ugliest set of macros, but it allows you to do for each int, i, and a whole list of things, and it will iterate i through those things. Um, you can break, continue, all that stuff. It really is a for loop. Uh, you can nest them to recursion, go nuts. For each pointer is even better, and this is type checked, so if p is not a char star, or a const char star, if you've got, got one char on, that will actually give you a warning. Um, a, a particularly ugly warning, but there will be a warning on that. Uh, and that allows you to iterate it. This, this is actually really great for writing. Uh, I use it. In some places, I use it for tests because it's really great for writing one line as like that. Um, list, Linux kernel style linked lists, not quite Linux kernel style linked lists because I hate the fact that there is no distinction between a head of a list and a node in a list for the Linux kernel ones. Even though for 99.999% of cases, you really do care. Uh, but very close to that. A lot of people grab CCAN just to get my list module. Um, I wrote all some of the list. I wrote, I don't know, 20%, 10%, something like that, of the kernel list one. But this is a re-implementation, and it's LGPL. There's the other reason people grab it, rather than GPL, as the kernel list. Uh, and there's also a T list, which is a type safe list, which you actually say, I'm going to put this type into the list, and it actually checks it for you. It's a little bit more painful to use, slightly. Well, I haven't migrated most of my stuff across the T list now. Fail test. This is the awesome. So I said the run tests actually have to include the C files. Well, with fail test, you include fail test override, which redefines malloc to mal fail test malloc, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you have to include your source files, and then you include uh, fail test antidote or something that, that undefines them. And, um, and then it basically runs through, it forks, and the children, of course, fail the malloc and everything else. This is awesome, especially when you run under Valgrind. For doing your 100% coverage testing, this is what gets you there. It tests your malloc data paths. And it checks that you don't overwrite memory or leak memory or whatever else down all those paths. And if you don't expect your module to handle malloc failures, for example, you can actually tell there's a whole lot of mobs in fail tests to say, actually, don't fail malloc, etc., etc. So, fail test, this is also under continuous, this is, this is active development for fail test. We want to be able to extend it with different functions. Uh, but already incredibly useful for, for thorough testing. And opt. Who here has ever used get opt long? Who here has used popt, for example, the popt from the other option libraries? Yeah. This is as much better than popt as popt is than get opt long. Get opt long is horrible. Um, so is get opt. Uh, just use opt. So it's awesome. Um, and short. Sorry? And short. And short, yes. Uh, it's getting slightly longer because I had a picture recently. But it's, it's still <laughs> it's only three that's long. Um, future. We, don't make, we have a top-level make file to build the whole a libc camp, which doesn't really make any sense because it's a bundle of crap. But it, <laughs> exists, I mean, because it builds every module and links it together uh, and then chucks it into a library. Um, <laughs> the problem is that it's a GNU make file and it uses the percent operator. Percent cannot include a slash, so that's why we have a flat directory hierarchy. If we get rid of make files, for that stuff as well, we can finally nest module subdirectories. So rather than a module name being foo, it could be foo slash bar, which solves some of our namespace problems. You can have private submodules within a module, for example, and later on, potentially, we can hierarchize and organize them the way CPAN does. Um, so weaning off make files completely, but this kind of requires we have a CPAN tool. This doesn't exist, uh, but it would be nice if you could run CPAN tool and tell it, just give me a make file fragment that will build this module. And it will do all that. Or an auto conf, you know, uh, auto make fragment that I can just include. Or a WAF fragment and all those things. So we can just completely wean ourselves off and CCAN tool will do that work for us. People want this, which is really weird because there's a git tree. It's 70 modules. You can just grab the git tree. It's not that hard. We also provide tables and we provide tables including dependencies. Really, really easy. But people still want a tool that can download because CPAN has it. They also want to be able to update modules, and that's not as easy as it sounds because in a lot of places people grab stuff, hacked it to fit, and then they want to see if the new version still works. 
So you really want to grab the Git version, do the diff, do the merge, let them test it, and then let them commit. And that would be kind of cute. Okay. Nicer web page. Yeah, my web skills suck. Um, <laughs> in the future, of course, there'll be more modules, and we expect to see a lot more incremental tooling. Okay. Um, we have 10 seconds left. Any questions? Yeah. I look forward to your submission. <laughs> um, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, um, I, so anything, if you give me code and it does not have an info, info, info file, it doesn't pass the basic four CCAN link tests, I will still accept it. And we have a special area for, for slightly unloved code called the junk code area. Um, and people can take code from there if they want to and manipulate it in shape and, to, and upgrade it to a module. So I will accept anything that I can redistribute and put it in somewhere in CCAN. So please. Uh, Ron, it's um, three o'clock. Up in his out. Here's a little present for us. Here's some coffee. Thank you.